So this is actually a talk on how I learned how to use MacBooks. Uh, <laughs> welcome to, if not you, a guide to community. My name's Abby, as introduced. I'm about to talk to people about how to build a mutual aid network and also how not to build a mutual aid network. One thing just before we get into any of the major things, welcome to EMF camp. It's very cold for a lot of you. Some of you may be experiencing signs of hypothermia. I recommend you bundle up in nice warm things and have a hot drink. Unfortunately, I got the other end of the spectrum and I had heat exhaustion. <laughs> if you have heat exhaustion, drink lots of water, please. It's very important that you don't pass out or end up in the first aid tent. So, who am I? I am an InfoSec person, which is one of the worst things you can be. I apologize for my sins. I work with the Trans Tech Tent, which is a mutual aid group. And what we do is we fix people's technology. I fix everything, um, even if I don't know how to, which is how I learned how to use Mac in the next like, 10 minutes. Uh, I fix phones, I fix laptops, I fix screens, anything that can be fixed, I give it a go. Also, that little bit at the bottom. There was another name on the speaker card. My wonderful partner, Jane, is also here, uh, helped me write this talk. Uh, so, she's currently vibing with chronic illness in the front. <laughs> Uh, she is one of the few people in the community who can drive, so she is our wheel woman, running around town helping, the, helping everyone out. You may see her around with her light up purple cane. Please say hi very gently. And uh, if you spam our Twitter account, she's the one that gets notifications on her phone, because she was brave enough to download it. So, trans tech tent. We are lots of trans people who do technology and have a tent, which is kind of why we're here. We do repairs, we do biohacking as well, which is really cool. If you want to um, do the boring kind of biohacking where you put an LED in your arm, that's fine. If you want to change your entire endocrine structure so that no one can um, recognize you with you know, facial recognition cameras anymore, we can do that too. It's great fun. And we also teach people, and that's one of the big things. There's no point in having a set of skills if you can't pass it on to someone else, and that's kind of what we're about. So, what are we learning today? We're going to learn what mutual aid is, why it's worth doing, and how you can do it too. You will also all graduate with an associate's degree in red panda iconography. I'm not sure if you've realized this yet. So, a lot of people might be interested in the history of mutual aid, its origins, the politics of it, and a whole host of really cool and interesting context for how mutual aid works. However, this is a no theory zone. I do not read, I cannot read, reading is far too difficult for my small brain. There is a place for a long history of mutual aid, but this isn't it. This isn't a talk about any kind of history work, this is just things that you can do. I pushed all of the theory out of my brain to make room for more red pandas, as we can see, and this may affect the quality of the talk slightly. So, mutual aid 101, what is mutual aid? Mutual aid is not charity. It's not something where a large organization comes and piles money on you and says, go help the poor. It's about sharing your skills with the community. It's taking you know, what skills you have, what things you can do, and giving, it, you know, giving your time, giving your expertise to people who don't have that. And in return, you might get something back if you're in trouble or if you need something fixed. So a lot of people in the InfoSec community like to call it like paying it forward. Uh, where what you'll do is you'll help someone else in the hope that if you needed that help, you would get it back. So it doesn't need to be an organization. You don't need to have like a community interest company. You don't need to have a charity registered or anything like that. Uh, we just find that a framework for mutual aid really helps build a community around it so more people get involved. It's not just strangers anymore. You know, you have friends and you get along with each other. You have a good time. So. Why do we have mutual aid? So for the trans community, um, obviously we're in a position where, you know, if you look at studies in the US, trans women are paid 60% less than cisgender people in general. Uh, it's much harder to get work, even with the same skills. We don't have that kind of social mobility that a lot of not, like cisgender people will have. And you need to work around that. 
A lot of other groups also face these struggles, so you will find mutual aid groups that deal with a lot of different teams, communities, that kind of thing. And sometimes the conditions that you grew up in and live in will overlap and they multiply each other. So, you know, some of us struggle with rent, some of us struggle with food, and the thing that we focus on is technology. Uh, digital poverty, major issue in impoverished communities. So everyone needs access to the internet nowadays. If you don't have the internet, you can't do much anymore. You know, a lot, of, a lot of disabled people will need to order things to their house. Also, universal credit is all online. And if it's not online, then you have to go 30 miles to the nearest universal credit place, and the job center is horrible. So, seeing as charities are often a bunch of people outside the community taking lots of money to um, improve everyone's life without actually asking what would help anyone, we can take things into our own hands instead and ignore charities in favor of mutual aid. So, why would you do mutual aid? Because, uh, you know, if you're set for life, if you have a nice large bank account and everything you could ever think of, why bother? You get some field experience. You get to test things out, you get to try things, and you get to basically expand your own knowledge base through doing. Really good idea. And you get to meet people along the way. So you get to learn from other people who are in the same field as you. You know, you might see someone trying to repair the same kind of phone. They bring out the new model. They've done it before. They can teach you a few new tricks. You might need to do a little bit of digital forensics. And, you know, there's a couple hard drives on there that you've never had to deal with before with a different partition system. They can teach you how to go through that. Useful stuff. And then you get to teach other people things that you know and they don't. It's a really rewarding experience. You also get to build a community and be part of a community that is way more than the sum of its parts. And they'll rally around you when it's your turn to get something fixed or if you need help. So a quick story. Um, we have been doing repairs for, what, two years now? Year and a half, two years. So we've been doing it for quite a while, and we've uh, fixed a lot of phones and a lot of laptops. Someone came to us with a broken USB-C port. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with it at all. So we ended up finding a new, like someone who'd never been in the community or helped us before. And they came along, and they're like, I can reflow this. Like, I have the kit. I have all of the kit. I have all the specialist equipment I need. Just give it to me, and I'll give it back in a week. And, you know, we said hi. We got to sorting all of it out, sent the machine off, comes back in a week, works perfectly. That's one person who couldn't afford a new laptop with new hardware, and a new person bought into a community because they didn't have any friends in the area, it turned out. Mutual benefit. So, how do you make a mutual aid? Hopefully I've sold you on why it's good and cool, um, but how's you get one off the ground? So you've got to have three things. You, you need people, you need space, maybe some money. So you don't always need to have these straight off the bat, but it does help to think about them in the long run. That'll help you keep going. You need to figure, need to figure out some people who have passion in their field or expertise and skills that they can share. Some people will play themselves down. Um, this is really common. A lot of people will be like, oh, well, I don't have any skills. But actually, things that everyone takes for granted can be skills. Driving is a skill. Making good meals is a skill. Um, kind of nutrition is a skill. And even inside technical communities, things that everyone takes for granted can be really useful. So if you know how to use, say, you know, you, you can navigate the universal credit system. You can help people with that. If you've been through something and you don't want anyone else to suffer through it, that's a skill that you can share with someone else. So bring them along. Take them into your little social group. Start talking with them. Get them involved in things. And maybe you'll find someone else in need who fits that skill set. You don't need an expensive office when it comes to space. You don't need to have like your own office. You don't need to get a little high-rise apartment block or something like that. You can use your house if you're struggling for space or places. We're fortunate enough that a local cafe opened their doors to us and they let us do safe exchanges of equipment. So um, we don't get stalkers turning up at our door and um, everyone else 
can get a nice easy bus into the middle of town to hand off their equipment. Very useful for us. You'll probably be able to do that. Uh, local libraries are a really good place if you just talk to someone behind your local library and be like, hey, we're doing this thing, can we meet up here? Is that fine? They'll probably let you do it for free. And then you know, think about money. Are you going to need it? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. A little money goes a lot further in a mutual aid than it will in your traditional charity. But think if you need to raise it, how are you going to? Outreach is very important. Um, touching grass is for people who go outside. I do not go outside. And because I don't go outside, I need to talk to people through screens. So we need a method of facilitating that. Now, regardless of data privacy concerns, because the companies mentioned here are terrible for it, uh, getting yourself out there on social media is important as an organization. You've not really got many OPSEC concerns when you're, you know, dealing as a faceless group compared to being an individual, but those might be something to pay attention to if someone's targeting you. Uh, our Instagram account was actually a complete throwaway. Uh, we just built it because, you know, we're building all the social medias. Why not? Let's see if the name's reserved. Turns out that the thing that I hate most in my life out of all the social networks, apart from maybe LinkedIn, um, is where we get all of our people come through. The majority of people who talk to us do it through a social media site that we all hate. Which, um, you know, taking one for the cause. <laughs> uh, our Twitter page is where we get most help offers and working with other organizations. And, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook kind of exist on the periphery. You get the occasional trickle through. The idea is that you are accessible to as many people as possible. So not only can you help others, others can also help you in the format they're most comfortable with. The last thing you want to do is learn an entirely new tech stack. You don't want to, like, build your own IRC channel and have someone figure out how to use IRC just to tell you that like they can repair an iPhone 7. So try not to be overly specific. Try not to bring everyone and force everyone to use the one thing that you like to get people involved because that will wall you off from 80% of the people who otherwise could do a lot for you. Organization is very important. Um, so one of the important things about organization is not to do your talk with 10 minutes to spare before you go on stage. <laughs> the whole point of organization is, you know, you're sharing the load. Um, so one person can't do everything. You know, who if not you? If no one else is going to do it, you should. However, if you can get someone else to get involved and you can get someone else to help take the load off, that's really, really helpful. And to do that, you need to share information. You need to organize that information somewhere where everyone can see it. Now, we threw up a Google document for this. You don't need to have a massive sprawling spreadsheet with like SLAs and trends and all sorts of weird business stuff to make it work. Just who wants a thing fixed? Who can fix the thing? And we do a little bit of extra stuff just so we can poke people along the process. So when did we get the thing in? And what stage is it at? Just as a few ideas. So sharing information will help everything run smoothly for you. And then we hit stumbling blocks. Things that have kind of tanked organizations in the past. I've been here for quite a while um, in my kind of mutual aid scene, organizations helping out. But this is also true of a lot of other organizations. Uh, burnout is super, super hard to deal with. So prevention, better than cure. No one is necessarily going to jump on your list of stuff to do and do it. Sometimes you need to give them a poke, which is why you need to delegate to them. Poke people who you know have some skills. Be like, hey, we need, so, you know, we need like 16 phones repaired. They're all on the list and no one's taking them up. You poke some people and be like, hey, can you take one of these? Can you take one of these? And before you know it, you're through that list. So if you don't do this, you'll end up with a massive pile of phones on your desk, sat there for two months, not getting anything done because you're overwhelmed by them. Moderation is very important. <laughs> so moderation is probably the one thing that's killed the most communities out of, everyone, out of every place I've been. 
Um, this kind of comes from the plate, like obviously from the position of a trans person. Um, nothing is more horrible than seeing the one dude who you wished would just shut up being allowed to just run rampant in the community and just like do whatever he wants because he's not technically breaking the rules, but literally everyone wants him gone and they don't feel comfortable. So if anyone does actual abuse, I say actual, like if anyone does any verbal abuse, physical abuse, anything in your community, even if they haven't done it on your platforms, kick them out. It's really simple, it's really obvious, but some people just don't get it because they don't want to start a fight. Do it, it's worth it in the long run. A tiny little bit of conflict now will save you months of having to deal with drama in little chats on the side. It is not your responsibility to explain or rehabilitate anyone who you remove from your community. You can just tell them they're gone. And then block them. Definitely block them, because otherwise you will get like 60 paragraphs about why you should be unblocked, and it's just like Darvo and guilt tripping. On that note, if you have a code of conduct, it is not important how you have worded your code of conduct. It is important how you moderate your community. So you can, you know, if you have a bunch of rules and they're specifically worded, someone is gonna try and rules police it and be like, well, actually, it says this. And you need to have a moderation team that understand that they can go off vibes. If someone is being absolutely rancid, they are breaking the code of conduct by spirit, not by word. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that, and that's very important for your community. But I will say that um, you, know, you, might, you might think after a few of those bits, um, this kind of sucks. Am I, am I just going to make a mutual aid and then immediately have like 50 people turn up, ask for their phones to be fixed when I don't know anyone yet, and then like have three abusers come along, and then have to use meta products? Um, unfortunately, you will probably have to use meta products. I'm very sorry. However, most of it is good and fun and cool and you have a great time, and you meet loads of people, make new friends, and you get like a whole new reason to exist in the community, more reasons to live. The bad stuff is a tiny fraction. It's a tiny, tiny little fraction. The reason that I've been talking about them isn't because they happen all the time, it's because I've seen it, and just one bad shot will take down an organization. So basically, I'm just giving you stuff in your toolbox so that if it ever happens, you know how to deal with it and you're not having to run around and try and figure out the answer. So, my appeal to you is to go out and make a mutual aid. If, you, you know, if there's one in the area, join it. See what you can do. Offer up your skills to someone who needs them. There are digital poverty groups all over the place if you want to just like fix tech for everyone. Uh, there are more specific ones. The Trans Tech Tent runs in Wales. And mutual aid is much bigger in the United States. So if any, if any of our visitors are from the States, you'll almost definitely find something in your local area. A couple stories here. We have the iPhone XR, very well manufactured. Um, they decided that they were just going to get a glass plate and glue it all down. Just glue the whole thing. Every square millimeter of that is glued. So. Much the same with the MacBook Pro's touch bar, when they had the touch bar, they're all glued down. So we had the laborious task of spending four hours chipping all that off to put in some new things. And you're like, oh, that's terrible. You know, the glass shards everywhere, it's such a mess. But actually, when you see the finished product, you're kind of proud of it. <laughs> I wasn't expecting applause for that bit because when I got through them all, I was just breathing a sigh of relief that I didn't have to touch them ever again. But you, you know, you get frustrated when you do mutual aid because you, you know you get in things that are horrendously broken, and you're like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll never do this again. It's been an absolute ordeal. And then like the second it's over, you're like, actually, if anyone else came along and wanted me to do this, I've learned a bunch of stuff, and I'll do it in like five minutes next time. It'd be fine. It's great fun. But you know, the the, the sense of accomplishment you get from doing mutual aid is fantastic. And I really hope that some people, you know, give it a go. If you have a small pot of funding, like we've, we have like a thousand pounds over a year and we fixed 50 machines, whether those were brand new iPhones, Samsungs, you know, Android phones, laptops, MacBooks, yeah, we even fix MacBooks. Um, 
It costs like 300 pounds for a new screen for one of those. It's a nightmare. It's just, you know, go out there and give it a go. Your money goes a lot further as part of a mutual aid, and the rewards are way higher as well, because you're not sending it off to like a faceless organization to redistribute it. You get to see and talk to the people who you help. So thank you all for coming. Uh, be nice to trans people. If you are trans, be nice to yourself. Very important. And I don't know what we're like for time. So, do we have any? I'm going to let everyone do questions, if that's OK. So how can you find mutual aid groups? So that's a good question. Um, a lot of the time, I browse Twitter, because I'm terminally online. Um, and I will find them that way. It's usually quite a lot of word of mouth stuff. But who, if not you, means if you don't have one already in your area, make one. But also, you can do that regardless. So if you make your own and then you find out all of a sudden that like, there's another group that does exactly the same thing that you do, you can just talk to them and you merge. Just you know, get out there, get involved straight away, and then it, it turns out that someone else is doing a thing, just slide in with their organization and help them out. Or not if they're bad people. <laughs> But yeah, I, I find Twitter is a really good place to learn about it. Because um, Twitter has kind of got a lot of mutual aid orgs using it. It's the default, I feel. There isn't like a map online or anything like that. But that might be a resource that I might think about. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, we have another question. There's still two minutes left. Any, any more questions? Hmm. So if I feel conscious that I'm taking away uh, work from commercial ventures, um, I will say no. Uh, I personally do not care if I'm taking work away from a commercial venture because the people who we help usually can't afford it. The vast majority of people who do talk to us are like, I am on the verge of homelessness, or I am actually homeless, um, and someone has thrown my iPhone at a wall, or the iPad that I had for five years, because uh, I got it as a university present, has been smashed, and I can't make rent this month. So most of the things we deal with, uh, we're not really stepping on anyone's toes. But even if we did, um, personally, because it's, because we work with disadvantaged groups, I wouldn't care if we stepped on their toes. Yeah, so you're, you're, basic, you're basically running your own mutual aid on um, just on a little Facebook group. Um, I, so I think it's, it's not necessarily like a myth that you know, we're killing an industry by doing the work we do. Uh, but I would say you know, most people aren't going, to use, aren't going to use that as a paid service for, those, for a lot of the fixes we make, and people won't think it's worth it or can't afford it outright. So keep doing what you're doing. And genuinely, you know, don't be afraid that you are stepping on other people's toes because that work would not be done otherwise. I guarantee you, no one's going to go into a, no one's going to go into a workshop or like a repair place and be like, "Hi, can you just like replace the fuse on this?" <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, no, writing a rule can be difficult sometimes. Absolutely. Um, so that's if you run if you run things by vibes and you accept that you're running them by vibe, it works a lot better. Um, case by case is kind of how we deal with a lot of our stuff. We ended up putting in a rule for a maximum limit for repair fees because we have a limited amount of money. Obviously, we can get in, but we still have a massive need to give people working devices. There's a, there's one more question over there. Uh, so we have actually talked to Cardiff Hackspace. We are local to Cardiff. Um, we're looking at getting a membership because we might need access to some 3D printers and other tools. But actually, because we've 
got a wide enough community by now, most of the things we need we already have. We do work extensively with other organizations though, um, not specific tech groups, but like mutual aid groups in Cardiff. Uh, we do basically all of the tech repairs for an organization called TransAid Cymru, who, you know, Welsh TransAid. Uh, so yeah, reaching out to organizations is super important. If you can do it, then do it. Thank, thank you very, very much. The, the, this one was a lot question. of... I don't know if we're past yeah, time. We, we would have to have one more question. Okay, quick question. Hi. So I, I kind of built this talk together because I couldn't find any. <laughs> so, um, you know, depending on how useful people find the talk, I might go ahead and upload something onto our website. Um, I'll probably put the slide deck on uh, with notes because the notes are long and meandering. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll build a resource if I can't find one. And if, I, if you reach out on Twitter, then I can kind of get in touch and we can discuss that. Thank you very much. Please give a warm hand to Abby.